Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil Fisher. This is the Phil Fisher Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Hi, Sky. Welcome back. Thanks. I was on vacation last week in Michigan, blowing stuff up. Yeah. And Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi. How are you? Blue. Yes, I've got blue on. Robin's today. egg blue. I would. I love that. Okay. Or, yeah. Maybe. Or electric. Electric company blue. Mm-hmm. And we've got a special guest this week, Dr. John Walton. Woo-hoo. Hey. Hi, John. Back again. Welcome back to the show. Who knew? Uh, uh, I did. We set this up weeks ago. That's true. Except the first time, the date we picked, you realized you weren't even in town for. Yeah, and then, that's right. Yeah, that <laughs> I was... scheduled a podcast when I was in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Villa Fisher podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. When is the S? <laughs> and Christian, too. Hola. And Dr. John Walton is shalom. here for you. <laughs> did you say shalom? Shalom, I did. <laughs> Do you know any other Hebrew greetings? Oh, uh, barely. <laughs> hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Now. Uh, the Phil Fisher Podcast is brought to you by you, viewers and listeners like you. Support the podcast so we can keep making it and getting it to the world for free. Uh, so you can go to Patreon, patreon.com to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Phil Fisher, and you can support the podcast so that we can keep making it. Thank you so much. We're feeding our, uh, uh, what's your title? Director, editor, whatever. Everything. Jason, we're feeding our Jason based on your lovely donations. Can, can I plug something? Yeah, uh, Sky now would like to plug something. I, well, it's kind of a story and a plug. Sky would like to plug a story. So last night, a friend from church, we had a bunch of people from church over at our house. One of them was Don Kearns and his, and his wife. And they um, volunteer down at the Angola prison in Louisiana. It's like one of the largest prisons in the country, this huge thing. So he told me a while ago that my With God Daily devotional was, he was passing it along to some of the prisoners down in the Angola prison. Uh, the problem is they don't have free email down there. To get access to email, you have to pay for it. Really? So the, the, he asked me permission and they are now running hard copies of my daily devotionals down there and spreading them through the prison. So yesterday he came over to my house and he gave me this envelope full of handwritten letters from inmates, including on death row, wow. who are reading the With God Daily devotional. And so so um, part of the reason that that has been able to get down there and have a positive impact on people is because of the people who actually pay for it and subscribe to it. So thank you if you have been a subscriber and are supporting You're welcome. It. You're, yeah, thank you, Christian. <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of really encouraging to hear some of those stories wow. that you would never That's anticipate cool. where, this, That's really neat. where this goes. Yeah. From Angola Prison mm-hmm. in where? Louisiana. Louisiana. And I have to say, I honestly feel like God has got is on a roll through those devotionals. I've been learning stuff recently that I have not been challenged to think about before. And, you know, it really is sets my day in thinking sort of along the godly way. So I really appreciate you doing it. We're going through the book of Acts right now, one chapter a day in the devotional. So if you jump in, you can still get most of Acts before the end of July. Fascinating. Good stuff. How many of the chapters, how many of the devotionals are about the church? Well, a fair number because it's Acts, yeah. but not all. I mean, I'm doing one devotional per chapter and there's obviously a lot okay. of content I can't cover. I'm kind of selecting a single idea out of each chapter and gotcha. using that. Well, and you, you, you also make those intensely personal because you say, you ask questions at the end every mm. time, sort of how we should think about ourselves in light of what the text teaches. So, Okay. It was a uh, rough week. Obviously, I was out of town, but I was getting news updates from Dallas, from St. Paul, from Baton Rouge, Mm -hmm. uh, police killing black men, black men killing police. Not a very pretty situation. I don't feel overly qualified to say a whole lot about that, other than that it's messy and not getting any less messier. Uh, you said you had a thought or two? Well, I my thoughts are that my heart is broken. You know, my yeah. heart is truly broken for, um, I do completely agree um, that it has been incredibly difficult for our back black brothers and sisters, as well as, you know, any person of color to feel comfortable uh, 
sort of in this American culture. And uh, it goes, you know, way back. I've been watching the OJ Made in America documentary. I don't know if you have mm -hmm. seen that. And I started that before this whole thing happened. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to watch it, but my husband did. So I did. And it has been incredible because this documentary is not just talking about OJ. It's talking about the culture uh, in the United States starting back in the, you know, mid 60s. And it was so shocking what led to OJ's acquittal and everything else was how the black people were treated by the police officers um, back then. And it just bubbled over. Mm -hmm. And it was just so timely what just happened to, to demonstrate that we are still dealing with these things, you know, right. 30 or more years later. Um, I think what's tragic for me is that, you know, a killing of white police officers doesn't solve the problem. It just compounds it. And um, when you sit there and say, well, what is the way out of this? Or how do we make sense of that? I wrestle with that all week. And the only thing that sort of got me over that hurdle is what I was telling you about later. In reading through Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes I think there's a lot of answers there about the way to think about these things. And the Bible Project videos that you told me about, Sky, that deal with Ecclesiastes, I highly recommend um, you watching those because it's a seven-minute thing that summarizes how we deal with this meaningless, terrible stuff that happens in life. So, I mean, I don't know. What do you say to that, Sky? No, those are all good good suggestions. Um I was speaking yesterday morning at a church in the city that's very multi-ethnic, um, a lot of African-Americans, a lot of uh, Anglos, a lot of Asians, a lot of Latinos. It's just, it's a, and, and so this whole week has been pretty traumatic for that congregation because there's a lot of people there involved with Black Lives Matters. Um, and it was interesting talking to them, talking to the pastor who's a friend of mine about how they're processing it. And some people look at this situation and go, well, this is just how it's always going to be. There's nothing that can really be done about it. So who cares? I saw one really horrible video online beyond the terrible videos of the shootings of some Christians basically saying, this isn't our area to work on. This is, uh, it was a very dualistic theology that said, all we should really be focused on is saving souls. These kinds of systemic injustices have always been with us and they always will. So why bother? Which is a completely wrong mm -hmm. response to have. But there were a couple of things that I read and, and looked at this week that brought some hope and encouragement to me. Um, number one, I think th this could cut either way, but the reason why this is becoming so much of a of an issue now is not because it's new. It's because we have the technology where more of these incidents are being caught on video and shared rapidly around the world. So for a lot of us who have been isolated from African-American communities or from African-American brothers and sisters in the church who haven't heard about these injustices in the past, we're suddenly being made aware of them because of the videos. So we, we shouldn't be looking at this as a new problem. It's always been there. It's just reaching our awareness. But then secondly, um, there are some really phenomenal stories of police departments around the country that have made major improvements. Well, and Dallas is one of them. Dallas is one of them. Las Vegas is another one. It's been shown that with the right training and the right procedures in place, the number of police shootings overall, including the number of shootings of African-American men, can go way, way down. And so this is not an insurmountable problem. Um, Obviously, no one is in agreement that targeting police officers is ever a good idea, uh, and that unfortunately, this this really disturbed person in Dallas who did this is going to derail a lot of the progress that could have been made from peaceful and and helpful protesting. But I I would been encouraged even on social media to see how many white pastors and predominantly white churches are now engaging this issue. And it makes me think that maybe we can break down some of the silos in thinking that there are certain black church issues and there are white church issues and they just don't overlap at all. This is a, this is a sanctity of life issue that the church mm -hmm. should care about, whether it's police lives or African-American lives or uh, a criminal justice system, which is systemically racist and broken in many, many ways that needs to be reformed. And this is an area where both Democrats and Republicans are interested in reforming. So I think it's something the church can... Uh, jump into and actually help lead in a positive 
in a positive way. My brother wrote a piece. My brother Rob uh, wrote a piece for the National Catholic Review called uh, Catholic Universities and Black Lives Matter, Why Our Schools Must Address Racial Injustice. And this would also apply to uh, Christian schools as well. But he raises a really good point that most state schools have gotten out of the business of character shaping, you know, Mm -hmm. that more and more colleges are simply trying to give you the classes you need so that you feel like you can make enough money to live. And the notion of actually shaping the character of the next generation is too controversial to even touch. So they don't touch it anymore. Mm -hmm. And his point is that's where Catholic universities, that's where Christian universities come in because they still feel a call to shape character. You know, and we really, I mean, character matters and how we shape lives matters. Um, And that is something that Christian universities and Catholic universities do and can still do uh, probably much better than secular universities. So there you go. You can find, if you want to read that piece, it's at um, americamagazine.org. My brother is Robert K. Vischer. So one last question about this whole thing that's been on my mind, which is slightly controversial. Yes. And that is normally when there's a mass shooting, whether because of a mentally ill person or a terrorist or whatever, if there's a mass shooting... In short order, the NRA usually makes a statement afterwards about something regarding guns or gun control. And Wayne LaPierre, the spokesperson head of the NRA or whatever his title is, famously said after the Sandy Hook shootings that the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And that's kind of been their mantra because they're really, I mean, regardless of what you think of the NRA, they're pretty much a lobbying group for the gun manufacturers. And whenever these tragedies happen, gun sales spike. They just skyrocket so that they kind of in a sick way benefit from them. After the Dallas shooting of these police officers, they've been strangely silent because this was a case in which one guy with a rifle, a bad guy with a gun, Mm -hmm. did an awful lot of damage. And he was targeting a whole lot of good guys with, with guns, guns right, and they couldn't right. stop him. They ended up having right. to use a robot with a bomb with a bomb to stop him. So this is a clear case where somebody with, with evil intent and access to the right firepower was able to do a whole lot of damage no matter how many good guys with guns were happened to be there. Right. And there's even a bigger conversation about Texas in particular and their open carry laws because there were 20 or 30 people openly carrying right. rifles in the area and they couldn't do anything and the the, well and the police didn't the police had to come out and say if you are carrying a gun and there is an active shooter we have to assume you're a suspect Mm -hmm. you know and so they had 20 to 30 people around them that they had to treat like suspects because someone was shooting and there were all these people standing there with guns Uh, and and the uh, the head of the uh, Dallas Police Department the the police uh, superintendent said this is why we were against open carry yeah this is exactly Exactly why we were against this because we it puts police in terrible positions of having to make these split second decisions. Right. Someone is shooting. There's a guy with a gun. Normally you would say, well, that must be your shooter. But if if thirty people around you have guns, you have no idea what to do. Right. And this may be a complicating factor in the shooting of uh, Philando Castile, the, the African American guy in Minnesota, because when it, we don't know the full story yet, it's coming out. But when he was pulled over by the police officer, he had a legal yeah. firearm. He had a concealed carry permit, and he was telling the police officer that he had a firearm, and we don't know exactly what happened, but the police officer's attorney came out and said this had nothing to do with race. It had to do with the fact that this police officer saw a gun and reacted, and now mm-hmm. did the fact that the gun was being carried by an African-American man contribute to his fear and, and ended up firing on him? We don't know. We'll find out. But as more and more and more people legally carry guns, it puts police in really awkward situations where they have to make a split second judgment whether or not the person who has the gun is a threat. Right. And right. I fear that as we see the proliferation of these firearms, we're going to see more and more accidental shootings, both mm-hmm. children, people in homes, uh, you know, unprotected guns in places they shouldn't be, and then police having to make all kinds of plits, split second decisions in which race can be a factor and then more innocent people are dead. Right. In each one of these things, I, I spend time thinking about, you know, wanting to do something and how do I make a difference and what can I say? And the only thing that I've come down to is ultimately all I can do is make sure that the way that I speak and the way that I treat others and the way that I think about others is in a loving way representative of Christ in every discourse 
course online or everybody mm-hmm. I meet in the store or, um, and. But also how you raise your boys. And how I raise my yeah, own boys you, how to we, think. How or, we teach our kids to look at the other, mm-hmm. whether they're a Muslim or, you know, an African American or an immigrant or depending on your political persuasion, a Democrat or a Republican. Or even a non, <laughs> non-believer or an atheist. Yeah. Or, I mean, how we treat others that are different from us and believe differently and look differently. Right. Um, and not just with our words when we teach our children. And even, even for police officers, the, the, the notion that you can give a police officer a class that will rewire right. their thinking over, you know, 30 years of growing up in our culture, that's asking a lot from a class. It's true. <sighs> Do you have anything to say, John? Nope. No. What I really <laughs> want to know, learning. how did they handle <laughs> firearms in the Old Testament? Yeah. They had them. <laughs> And, you know, can I just say one thing about that? As I've been reading through this Old Testament, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I am reading makes what is happening today look tame. (laughs) Seriously. The ancient world was rough. It was pretty darn rough. And talk about people dying for no reason or senseless crimes happening or populations being wiped out. I mean, for people to say nothing has ever changed and I'm reading this stuff in the Old Testament thinking, oh my goodness, how far we've come. Although most in the Old Testament, most of the situations are more connected to warfare, national movement kind of things rather than crime on the streets. Uh, not that there wasn't crime on the streets, but that's right. that's not the stuff you read about too much in the Old Testament. And in much of the ancient world, penalties for crime on the streets oh, yeah. was pretty severe. Yes. The chopping off of hands. And, well, and still in some places of the world today. That is true. And they have less crime on the streets, I guess. Are you in favor of caning? Caning. <laughs> in, in, is it Singapore, where mm-hmm. if you litter, you can get... You know, there's an ancient Sumerian text that's yeah. in the University of Chicago Museum. It's a student's text, and he's writing about his experience at scribal school. And he gives line after line of things that he made mistakes on in his scribal work. And the refrain after each line is, caned me. <laughs> caned me. <laughs> this happened. Caned me. <laughs> so, yeah, this goes back pretty far. Okay. Yeah. How, what year would that have been written? Yeah. Oh, that's, it's a, it's a, uh, a scribal tablet. Yeah, probably in the early second millennium B.C. Oh, my word. 4,000 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You've seen it with your own. Oh, eyes? Yeah. It's done in the University of Chicago That's Museum. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, speaking of ancient world, um, Noah's Ark is open. Uh, open for business. The Ark so, Park. The yeah. Ark Park. Yeah. Uh, and with the opening of, of the Ark Encounter, the Freedom From Religion Foundation has just reminded more than 1,000 public school districts that it would be illegal to plan field trips to the creationist attraction. Uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation sent out a memo. This is a precautionary memo to advise that public schools and public school staff may not constitutionally organize trips to Ham's Ark Park with its clear religious goal and portrayal of fiction as divine truth. I don't, I'm not that, sure that's the regulation. Is this warning really necessary? Um, Are there a lot of public schools just chomping at the beat bit to get to the Ark Park? I think the assumption is there... Maybe are in rural America. I think the assumption is that the Freedom From Religion group just wants another press release to get some publicity. In summary, public schools cannot organize trips for students to either the Creation Museum or the Ark Park. Doing so would violate the students' rights of conscience and the Constitution. And other museums, natural history museums, have no agendas whatsoever <laughs> that have any impact on our religious thinking. Religious agendas? <laughs> Overtly religious? Yeah, well, is a lack of religion yes, absolutely. a religious agenda? Yes. This is the controversy, isn't it? What is religion? I just would rather Man. visit the you know, findings of Jupiter and then the Ark Park, which is a pretty cool thing happening. The Jupiter Park? The Jupiter Probe. Oh. Have you not been reading about no, that? Uh, NASA's no, has sent many years ago yeah. this, you know, Jupiter thing. To, it's yeah. Jupiter five. And Jupiter so five. It's Jupiter's a there. god. We can't do that. Yeah. Okay. See, looking, that has a religious agenda. <laughs> looking around and seeing okay. deep things that God actually created. Okay. That you know we that can know today. Jupiter is actually Indian. Right? Has a big red dot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my okay. goodness. I can say what that. What are we talking about today? Let's talk about hell. 
I brought uh, Dr. Walton on the show because I wanted to talk about hell. Particularly, I wanted to start from the, okay, hell is something that we all have a very strong sense that, oh, I know what that is. That's, you know, and then whatever it is you learned when you were a kid, fill in the blanks. Um, and as you actually read the Bible, you realize it's not quite as clear cut as it may have been presented to you in Sunday school or at a youth camp or by a Christian film that it, or by a chick track. Have you, do you have a collection of chick tracks? Oh, I, I did. I don't know if I have it anymore. But really? when I was a kid, you know, chick tracks were... Did you trade them like baseball cards? No, we got didn't it, go got that it, far. Needed, no. got it. Yeah, they yeah. had them. They had a rack of chick tracks. At the yeah. back of uh, the Bible conference, you, you know, have to Okaboji, explain like, the chick is not talking about a female no, no, hero. Here. What's yes. his name? What's the first name? <laughs> oh, Mister Chick. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. has a first name, Mr. and he, which bathroom does he use? He drew <laughs> <laughs> Mister Chick. Sorry, <laughs> it's a bar in Chicago. You probably shouldn't go into. Um, so he made all of these evangelistic tracks that were very colorful, very very colorful to say the least. Yeah. Graphic. Yeah. Graphic. Yeah. yeah. And uh, many conservative evangelical churches had a rack of tracks in the back that you could take. Rack of tracks in the back, Jack. <laughs> and you could take them and, and then leave them instead of tips at restaurants <laughs> to save people's souls. Put them in Halloween trick-or-treat yes, bags. Yes, put them yeah. in uh, little kids' uh, yeah. candy instead of candy. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was fun for the whole family. And so I would I would take a handful of them because the, some of the services at the Okaboji Lakes Bible Missionary Conference, I found dull as an eight or nine year old. <laughs> Not anymore though, they're fantastic. No, now they're fantastic because yeah. Sky's there and Dr. John Walton. <laughs> Uh, are you there this year? Not this year. Oh, no, Walton. Oh, well. <laughs> I've still yet to go. So I've got to make that happen. Yeah, it's right in Iowa. You can't miss it. Uh, <laughs> go to Iowa. Turn so right. I would grab a handful <laughs> of chick tracks, and then I would sit in the service reading these, and it was you know, people burning in the flames of hell and the Satan taunting them with a mm-hmm. pitchfork and all sorts of terrible things. Um, and then you read... You know, Were those the precursors to the four spiritual laws? Uh, well, it's the same kind of genre. Yeah, it's the same. It's, I mean, it's a the, track. The, the tract, the gospel tract, has a long and mostly illustrious history, I imagine, of distilling complex issues down into four or five little tiny pages. pages. It's kind of revealing that the Catholic tradition, when it puts out something about hell, comes up with a phenomenal poem like Dante's Inferno. Yeah. Which is a classic of Western literature. Yeah. And when the evangelical tradition comes up with something, it's a little disposable piece of flip paper that is mm-hmm. cartoon drawings and almost nothing. Well, because we're, we're adapting to what the, where the culture is now. People don't have time. How many of your friends have read Dante's Inferno? Well, you're assuming I have friends. It's like reading Shakespeare. Which is wonderful. It's, it's too long. <laughs> It's too. But it, the difference is, five hundred years later, they're still reading Dante's that's Inferno, true. <laughs> whereas yeah, it's a no very one's good point. reading. Uh, and it was it tracks. was it was of its time. Okay, back to hell. Okay, back to hell. So <laughs> so I wanted to start with the Old Testament because um, some interesting conversations have come up on our Facebook page and elsewhere. That okay, what does the Bible really say about hell? And let's go back to the beginning. What does the Old Testament? What was the Jewish? The ancient. Israelite conception of hell. They had none. Right. I actually had just learned this. Or heaven. (laughs) Correct. Um, That can't be so. They did not have any sense of reward or punishment after death. They um, understood the netherworld as a place they called Sheol, and everybody went there. It was not a place of reward. It was not a place of punishment. Uh, and that's really all they had. So what they tell their kids to make them behave? Keep the Torah. Santa Claus wouldn't Keep come. the law. <laughs> well, I, all you had to point to your, your nephew who was uh, smote by fire from heaven or by poisonous snakes or swallowed by the ground for messing up. I think that would be pretty effective. They were supposed to be identifying with the people of God, the covenant community, and being faithful to Yahweh, their God, 
and um, living out their identity as God's people. And but now heaven exists in the Old Testament in terms of God is in heaven. God is in heaven. In yes. the heavens. Yes. But they believe the, that heaven is not a place where you die and go. They believe that they're waiting for God to come here and perfect this earth and everything to be established here. They had no expectation of a future life with God after death. Is that why they all mm-hmm. became Sadducees? Uh-huh. <laughs> Sad you see. I've heard that joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that would, I mean, because Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Right. So that wouldn't have been a, a an openly heretical Jewish thought no. at the time. Um, you know, the first hint of, about resurrection comes in Daniel 12, and there it seems to suggest some variant... Uh, options for the righteous and the wicked, although it's not near complete enough a statement to develop okay. a doctrine from it. So, so where did they believe Elijah went? Don't know. You know, with Elijah, it indicates that uh, that this the uh, horses and the chariot, the whirlwind came and took him up into heaven or the heavens. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same word right. in Hebrew. Okay. And uh, we can discern from the... It's neither singular nor plural. It's correct. Dual. It's dual. Yeah. We, can dis- oh. we can discern from the context what they understood by it because Elisha goes back and reports to the sons of the prophets that Elijah had been taken up and they said... We better go find out where God put him down. <laughs> and they spend several days doing so. So it's clear. Basically like the wind would take him up and yeah. blow him somewhere else. Philip, Acts 8, right? You've covered that one already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Philip in Acts 8, he's transported. Mm-hmm. Huh. He just shows up somewhere else. And so th- they're wondering where he got put down. So mm-hmm. they're not thinking he went to heaven. If they if they did think that, it would be problematic for us anyway, because in Christian doctrine, we tend to think there's only one way to go to heaven, and chariots and whirlwind is not it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's mm-hmm. called Jesus. Okay, so regarding the Old Testament, though, <laughs> the ancient Israelites were surrounded by other cultures that did have somewhat elaborate theologies of the afterlife and thinking of the Egyptians yes. in particular. What influence or overlap is there at all with what the Israelites understood mm-hmm. versus what the Egyptians had? There's not a, not a lot of overlap with the Egyptians. Well, uh, why would the Egyptians have such an elaborate vision okay. of the afterlife and not the Hebrews? Um, the Egyptians concept of afterlife ha- is very heavily influenced by their own particular Egyptian beliefs. In other words, they believed that the soul would be preserved, the person would be preserved in the afterlife so that they could join Join the sun god in the the Ra. sailing across the heavens. Ra, Ra. Mm-hmm. and I've that watched he, Hollywood movies. Wow, and so <laughs> like national and, treasure. So it's sort of an exaltation <laughs> mm-hmm. that comes about a joining, Perfect. merging with the god. That theology never would have cut it in an Israelite setting. So what when when David, for example, uh, is is praying and grieving over his newborn mm-hmm. child that is ill, and then the child dies, and yep. he says. He will not return to me, but I will go to him. Another world. The, it's just another. Just world. another world. But what is like? Shay do they have any more details old. about the another world? Like what it comprise of it, or you know, yeah. I'm going to go to my Was father's it a mansion that kind of with that? many rooms. Um, nope. And the, a big, big yard to play football. Now, the the idea of uh, of being gathered to the fathers is represented in their burial practices because they're buried in family tombs. Uh, in a family tomb, the body would be laid out. Um, and over time, the flesh would desiccate, and finally, they would just brush the bones to the back of the of the tomb, gathered to their fathers. Desiccate means turn to dust. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, from yeah. dust you came, yeah. and from dust exactly. to dust you shall and return. So in that sense, they were gathered to their fathers. They also believed, you know, beyond that, that their nephesh, their self, their person. That's it's a word that sometimes is translated soul, okay. but that's not really a Hebrew mm. conception. Um, so their their self, their personness. Um, would uh, would then go to the netherworld, would join with the um, the community of the ancestors in the netherworld, and in that sense form a community in a netherworld context that had some connections to the community that continued to live. Whether you were good them. or bad. Whether you were good or bad. But, but here's the bottom line. Let's hit it, Christian. Go ahead. <laughs> Nobody really knows. 
I mean, nobody, right? you, you can't have any actual factual knowledge of this being of a Israelites certifiable, thought. no, oh. a certifiable truth. Well, you know, even then, those are things they decided our, to believe. Our, exactly. The point of our discussion, though, is to figure out what the Israelites thought. And there was no revelation that they received on that. So they're not getting, so they this is God's right. word about right. the afterlife. Right. They had their ideas that are not like Egypt's, but they are like what you find in Mesopotamia among the Babylonians, Assyrians, okay. so how, does that, how did the How did the ancient Israelite conception of the underworld or the afterlife uh, line up with the Greek conception when we get to Hades mm -hmm. and the river Styx and the dog. The it's a little closer coin. to that. And we see some of those same conversations in Babylonian texts so that, you know, Gilgamesh, when he goes, uh, you know, has to cross a river of death and things of that sort. So we find some of that in Babylonian literature as well. What's interesting is that the Israelites have the same general concept of a of a nether world that's kind of nondescript, uh, the same as the peoples around them, except Egypt, had. Uh, but nowhere in the Bible do they go into all of that detail about it. The most detail we have about a netherworld context is Isaiah 14, where the king of Babylon, who has been sent to the netherworld, is greeted by other kings, and they say, yeah, you're just as bad as we are now. We're dead. And that's that's about it. You know, okay. there's just not, not a whole lot. Well, I think the most surprising part for me is that the Old Testament does not include the concept of a post-mortem judgment mm -hmm. because that's so central to a lot right. of Christian theology and New Testament theology. So the, the, the promise of blessing or curse in the Old Testament is really for this life, this world, your people and their future, not your individual destiny post-death. Correct. It's for the corporate people, not for individuals as much. Which is an almost impossible thing for Americans to understand. And what about for non-Jews in the Old Testament? Because there is judgment mm -hmm. on nations that mistreated Israel. Is there a sense that if you were a nation, if you were a people group that had no relationship relationship whatsoever with Israel that you had blessing or curse based on your behavior. Certainly there, we see the judgments against the nations, the oracles against the nations and the prophets where the nations are held accountable and therefore judged by God. But of course they're not being held accountable to Israelite covenant or Israelite doctrine. Mm -hmm. They're being held accountable to larger issues. Okay. But, but issues that aren't necessarily related not to how they treated Israel? No, mm -hmm. not necessarily. Okay. Oh, sometimes that's mentioned. It okay. is sometimes mentioned. But remember, a nation or a people group can't go to hell, or to heaven for that matter. Okay? You Individuals... Should, should tell the people who live in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they always have this attitude that... What? Well, what trouble are you getting us in now? I'm just saying Batman. Texans have a, you know, that God bless Texas kind of thing. Oh. Like it's a, As like opposed to, be, to Americans with yeah. well, God bless America that, kind of thing? Haven't you seen that, that bumper sticker that says, I forget how it goes. Something. Don't mess with Texas. No, yes, not I've that one. All my <laughs> exes live in Texas. No. I don't pay taxes. I live in Texas. No. He, he really knows his Texas That's actually bumper stickers. That's yeah. there, there's, there's like that bumper sticker that says something like American by birth, Texan by the grace of God or something oh, like that. Okay. Yeah, but that's still not a matter of... You know, Texans are going to heaven. Right. Well, yeah. right. Can, yeah. can I ask a more important question? Please do, Christian. Okay, Get so, us back on track <laughs> here. All right. So if they have no real concept of, you know, punishment or hell or even heaven, how do they grapple with the idea of what their purpose in life is? Their purpose in life is to live out their identity as God's people. God has chosen them. But to what them. end? To the end to what of, benefit? To the end of participating in God's purposes and plan. That's what he called them to. That's what he expects and, of them. And, and that was my sermon in church blessing, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> receiving his blessing in the here and now. Sure. For, with, and, and for your and, children. And, and for your children. children, right. children and, and getting to remain in the land. For the right. people of Israel in an yeah. ongoing this world. Well, and one of the and fundamental differences, though, is, the, the, and many people today still think this way, just not North Americans generally, is their identity was so corporate rather than individual. We think about what's my individual motivation right. for doing X, Y, and Z or for my fate and destiny. And in their context and in many today, that's not the primary question. It's what's our identity? What's our purpose? Right. And how do I participate in that well, larger calling of this group? If that's the case... <laughs> then why in the world did they continually 
never do that. Never do what? I, over and over again. Why they do they don't, mess up so much? Yeah. Why are they constantly not doing what they why, think is important or gives them purpose in life? Christian, <laughs> why do you mess up so much? Because oh. I am a sinful human being. And despite ding, ding, ding. how much I want to do what God wants me to do, I continue to mess up. God had called them to certain ways of thinking that were totally contrary to the world around them. And it's just not easy to leave your worldview behind and start acting differently. You know, tomorrow, why don't you start not being a consumer? (laughs) (laughs) I've been trying not to spend money, but it's really hard. See? I mean, the, the things that we tend to value because they're part of our culture, are not easily shed, even if we're convinced that somehow right. they take us on the wrong path. Oh, see? Right. It's Again. It's that falls no. apart all Just the time. put it not, on the floor. Yeah. Not your fault. I, put it on I do the floor. that every week. It doesn't matter. Our it's set's falling stay. apart for those of you that are not watching. <laughs> Just oh, put okay. it on the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so then we get to we get to the first century. And then I've heard of we, that. How did we get there? <laughs> Time went by. Oh, okay. You know, well, Old when, Testament, you get to the New Testament. Yeah, you just, it's inevitable. Okay. You can't avoid it. You can't skip it. And now you get, you, you have in Greek, you have the word Hades being thrown around mm-hmm. in the New Testament, which for some reason I never noticed as a kid because mm-hmm. that was from Greek mythology at public school, not from Sunday school. But mm-hmm. Hades is in the New Testament. And then hell, which is Gehenna. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sometimes. Then you have Gehenna in the... Mm-hmm. in the. So, okay, what's the difference between Hades and Gehenna, and why do they use one as opposed to the other? And what do those two things mean? And how, all of a sudden, did Jewish people who hey. had never really believed in hell, all of a sudden now <laughs> there is a hell? I don't I understand was, that jump. I was asking the questions. <laughs> Sorry. I just gave him... He's, now he's forgotten my questions. <laughs> Hades. Hades. Is, is it, was it absolutely the same as Sheol? Not absolutely. Okay. Um, again, okay, people who grew up on the King James Version, like I did, because yeah. there was nothing else when I grew up, you know, back in the Jurassic period, mm-hmm. and the uh, King James translated Sheol as hell and translated Hades as hell. So we grew up thinking that the Bible, oh. the Old Testament, talked about hell okay, all over so the place. Hell, so the in the King James, hell is in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. It's Sheol. Yeah, Sheol. Yeah. And so uh, you, you grow up thinking that it is talking about it's hell. It's just hell, hell, and hell. sometimes they say say the grave, okay, the interpreter's yeah. choices there. But that's also true with Hades. Hades uh, could be talked of specifically as a generic netherworld, an afterlife, mm-hmm. um, or sometimes it was used to refer to a place of punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that word had its flexibility, and we see it used both ways. Okay. Um, Gehenna is a Greek adaptation of Hebrew terminology. You've probably heard this mm-hmm. before, okay, but just for the- people. The Valley or for of Christian. the Son of Hinnom, right? Yep. Gay Ben Hinnom, yep. Gay Ben Hinnom. Yes, because... Which the, later became Ben Gay. Yeah, the, hold on, hold on. You're confusing me. All right, A so, wonderful product. So Gehenna <laughs> that is pain the and suffering valley of, of the, the Valley of Hinnom. Right, and the Valley of Hinnom is the valley that cuts from the southern part of the city of Jerusalem around to the west, and it's the place where the children were burned to the god Molech. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I've a heard place that. It was a garbage pit. It was a, you know, just, just, it was a burning, it was a bad smoldering place. Bad garbage place. Yeah. It was a bad yeah. place. I, I have a question it's about that. It's like the that, tire though. fire in Springfield. Because, because <laughs> Jesus says you don't want to be thrown into the fires of Gehenna, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's exactly what he says. Where does Jesus say that? In, in the, the Bible. Bible, <laughs> <laughs> Bible um, gateway. Hello. <laughs> I don't know. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting with these three men and they can't tell me where and that's so it, said. It's it, a New Testament. It, it's in one of the gospels. <laughs> you don't know it, right? It's in a, it's in a gospel. It's like, it's, would you rather lose your hand, a a Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Cut off your hand if it sins against you, because you'd rather go to, say, go to heaven? What does it say? No. Rather live one-handed than have both. It's Matthew 6. Matthew 6. It's all over Matthew 6. Okay. Gehenna, Gehenna, Gehenna. It might be seven. You don't? I'm looking up. (laughs) Did they actually burn? What did they burn? That's what I was curious, because I've always heard, oh, there are always fires going in Gehenna. What are they burning? What was garbage that you would burn? All of the carcasses that they were sacrificing. Oh, there was parts of things they were sacrificing yeah. that they said, go Is and burn them they- up outside of the camp. Is that what they burned? Because they didn't have packaging. 
It's not like, oh, I just bought a new no, dress. They had what to... do I do with the packaging it came in? What did they burn? This is an issue <laughs> for a New Testament backgrounds <laughs> investigation. Uh -oh. Because you have to talk about what people in the first century A.D. Yes. thought was burned in the valley oh, of okay. Hinnom. And are you saying that's not you because you're an that's old, not me. Old Testament guy? Uh, oh, I am. Rats. Well, how? different can be what they did in the Old Testament from what yeah. they were doing in the first century. It cannot be that drastic. I'm glad you asked that, Christian. Yes, it can be. Very drastic. Ah. Um, <laughs> it's Matthew 5, 29. How for can it be so drastic? For his because better, whatever. Matthew 5, 29. Once you get past the Iron Age with the Israelites and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all of those which make up the ancient Near Eastern way of thinking, you suddenly get Persians. Persians for two they centuries, three centuries. No, they, they just <laughs> no, they, conquered. They invaded. <laughs> they conquered. And, and they brought with them packaging. Persian <laughs> thinking, Zoroastrianism, dualism, all kinds of different ways of thinking that were not current in Assyrian, Babylonian, Israel, and Egypt. And so you get 200 years plus of Persian influence. And then there's this guy named Alexander the Grape. Uh, <laughs> Not great. The details version. Yeah. <laughs> Alexander the Great, and you get the Hellenistic flow through, and so you get two serious, lengthy influxes of new ways of thinking that change things considerably. The New Testament is a Hellenistic Greco-Roman world, which is very different from an ancient Near Eastern world. So I'm, I have no this doubt so that a lot of our listeners <laughs> want to think that the theology and the concepts that we see in the New Testament just kind of dropped out of heaven or came directly from the Holy Spirit through inspired. the apostles and through Jesus and well, had no other outside cultural influence at all because that would in some way taint its purity and holiness. And that would be a problematic way of thinking because both Old Testament and New Testament are thoroughly embedded in their cultural contexts. That doesn't mean they're borrowing pagan literature. It just means that they're part of that way of thinking. And God addresses people in terms of the ways that they think in their culture. So again, God doesn't drop a cosmic geography from heaven and say the earth is a globe and it moves around the sun and the moon is a rock in space. And it He talks mm -hmm. to them in terms that they understand. Don't tell Ken Ham that. Okay. And it's the same. Hey, hey, don't start. It's the same thing with um, even when the New Testament talks about hell, it's using the terminology that was culturally understood. It's very difficult to find a passage in the New Testament that offers a teaching about hell mm -hmm. other than the basic idea that you are accountable and there will be judgment for your sin. So that, that gets down to the real issue here then is if these are all culturally formed, constructed uh, passages of Scripture, what can we extract from them as bedrock truths that we can hang on to that aren't just uh, what do we know about Hellenistic. hell we can know that sin has consequences that god holds us accountable and that he is one who judges what we do but okay. i want to know who's going there how much are they going to suffer and, and can they get out does it last forever <laughs> And just, doesn't the Bible <laughs> say that eventually hell will be destroyed itself? Thrown into the lake of fire. It, it Death says, and Hades it itself. It says Hades Death will be. Death and Hades. Okay, this well, is, is there really a difference confusing. between Cause, cause Hades and... Yes. yes. <laughs> Hades is, is Sheol. It's, That's the netherworld. It, yes. yes. So, so and this is what's funny when you get... I love trying to explain this to kids when, we, when what's in the Bible. You need to watch this I, on I Revelation. I know, I'm working on it. <laughs> because we talk, okay, what does this mean? And some people say, well, well, hell is a lake of fire. Look, there it is in Revelation. But then you see, well, for, for one reason, for another reason, elsewhere, hell is a furnace. Elsewhere, hell is outer darkness. So it's either a really bright furnace or it's really dark and or... It's it's a burning lake. Um, but then... Black fire. Yeah. <laughs> but then they start throwing things into the burning lake, and they throw the enemies of God into the burning lake. So you think, okay, well, that's hell. And the Antichrist. That's hell. And then the next thing they throw into the burning lake is the grave. Hades gets mm -hmm. thrown into the burning lake. And then after the grave is thrown into the burning lake, death is thrown into the burning lake. And that's the second death. Whatever that means. See, you know what, you guys? <laughs> My brain is hurting. Exactly. And, and what are we really supposed to take away? 
from all uh, of them. I thought them. I said that. Yeah. Well, um, say it sin again. has say it consequences. Again. Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. Wait, let's put numbers on these. Number, number one. one. Sin, sin has, has consequences. consequences. Number oh, two. Wait. Oh, good consequences or bad consequences? Sin has consequences that are bad. <laughs> okay. And okay. grace has consequences which are good. But those okay. consequences, unlike in the Old Testament, continue on post-death. Yes. Is that another one of your points? Because well, uh, I'll make it a different number. No, I, I was going to go with number two is okay. uh, people are held accountable. Okay, sin has consequences. People are held accountable even if not in this life. Yes. So you might not get kicked off your land like yeah. the Israelites right. were, but you, there's still... But your castle may not be as big. <laughs> There are no castles. Hell, Your mansion? Hell, no, no, it's not mansions. Yeah, it's, hell these are no. bad English translations. Hell ain't Sorry. no castle. What do I have to look forward to? <laughs> in my I was really wanting my big house. Are there in any virgins? In my father's house in are many Christian rooms, heaven. not mansions, <laughs> rooms. Okay, so I get a room. Rooms represent the insular household of the first century, where as different family members get married and add families, they add houses. There is ever-expanding room for more oh. people. Okay, so there's a lot of room. A lot of room. Okay. How big are the rooms? <laughs> Do I have really nice furniture in there? And I don't want to be alone. You know, I know there's no marriage in heaven, but it really makes me sad to think I would be in this big room all by myself. I think we're, we're heading down the heaven road instead of the hell road. Okay, yeah. so hey, can we get... shows about hell, lady. I know, let me yeah. get back to the hell thing. Is there marriage in hell? Maybe bad marriages. <laughs> Maybe well, okay, some people somewhere. would say... Let me ask you this. Sartre said hell is other people. <laughs> If Lewis did that too, yeah, he was quoting Sartre. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay, so I should understand that the Near Eastern thinking was that Sheol was just a nether world. They didn't under, They didn't think about hell as a place of punishment. However, in the New Testament, there is Hades, which is the same thing as Sheol, and Sheol, there, Sheol, and there is the. Valley of Hinnom. Gehenna. Gehenna, yeah. which Gehenna. is a place where they burn children to Molech. Mm-hmm. And, and trash. And, and, and trash, packaging. Which mm-hmm. is bad. And, um, but my mother always told me <laughs> that. <laughs> wait, now, wait, wait to bring it around. Now we're that, getting to authority issues. <laughs> that hell was re- ultimately separation from God. And that my consequences of unrepentant sin were what kept me separated from God, not only now, but also forever, forever, whatever hell is. And there are lots of different opinions. It certainly involves separation from God. And perhaps that is the very worst part of it. But the text really doesn't talk in those terms. Um, I kind of like what Millard Erickson says in his uh, theology book. Sin is man saying to God throughout his life, go away and leave me alone. Hell is God's finally saying, you may have your wish. (laughs) No, Mm -hmm. it gives us that kind of sense of it. When Mm -hmm. people choose to identify solely for themselves instead of identifying with God. But what's embedded in that or implied in that is that to be completely left alone by God is to have all of God's goodness and beauty and justice and life and all the things that are from him stripped away. Yes. Which is a pretty desolate and horrible... Mm -hmm. uh, N.T. Wright argues kind of for an annihilationist view that Mm -hmm. says essentially we become that like which we worship and if we refuse to worship God and continue to turn away from him, eventually we even lose our godly image bearing that we all retain it it dissipates and we lose our very humanity and it's eventually slip into some form of existence which is Mm -hmm. less less than than human existence right can i ask one thing that may muddy the waters but i think it's important about hell it is okay it's actually what happened when Christ died, and the Bible says oh. he went to mm. hell, no. right? He didn't? No, the Apostles' Creed says that in some of his okay, versions. Okay, so I'm confusing. <laughs> he descended to the dead is how yes, some he versions descended, descended to, the to the dead, which is Sheol. Hades. Mm-hmm. Or Hades. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's this netherworld place. Uh, it's the, where yes. the dead are. Yeah. And at that time, God did ab- abandon Christ, right? Because Christ says, why have you abandoned me? Forsaken. 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 Mm -hmm. She's quoting Psalm. So basically God had to turn his back on Christ because he took on all the sins of all the world. 
that's how it's ten- generally been interpreted. That's but a that reformed the text kind of really say that. Yeah, it's a reformed theology that's imposed on that statement. Right. That mm-hmm. may well be correct, but and so then what happened to him when he went to this nether world or place of the well, dead? One of the speculations, and we can only speculate because the text doesn't tell us, but one of the speculations is that he went there to reclaim the lives of those who had died prior to Christ providing the means for them to go to heaven. After all, if Christ is the only way to heaven, then before Christ died, you can't go to heaven. Mm-hmm. So it was, so that's all the people that were raised to go with him? Old Testament saints and things like that. That's one That's one guess. Isn't Again, that what is it, Peter mentions this, doesn't he? Peter... It, in some he, interpretations, right, that he, says, that he proclaimed, proclaimed to the captives, to the captives, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And so there are a couple of biblical passages that suggest that possibility, and as I understand it, that's why it ends up as one of the lines in the Apostles' Creed. Although it's one of the, it's the most disputed line in the Apostles' Creed. Some mm-hmm. versions don't have it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What's the second most disputed line in the Apostles' Creed? <laughs> I, I haven't done this. So wh- why does all this matter? Why does all? Why should it matter? What have we really learned? What can we say? Let's go through our things again. Number one, <laughs> sin has consequences. Two. And that's not so 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 we can firmly rule out universalism that everyone right. will ultimately end up in heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number two was accountability. God will hold us accountable mm-hmm. eventually, even if it takes mm-hmm. a long time. But what does that mean? It's kind of a play off of one, though. There's a con- yeah. there's consequences right. for yeah. Your there's sin. consequences for your sin. But if Jesus forgives them, well, but even in First Corinthians three, he talks about our, still our works will be judged, and the quality of each person's work will be determined and j- tested with fire, and some of it, that is wood, hay, and straw, will be consumed by the fire, and that which is and Jesus doesn't forgive them. He provided the means to. Achieve forgiveness. And in Matthew 8, where it talks about outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's the subjects of the kingdom who will be cast out. Very what? interesting. Yeah. Oh, now that scares me. <laughs> hey, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Again, this this shows the, the different sorts of um, rhetoric that's mm-hmm. used when talking about the horrors of hell um, and the idea that, you know, you've got all kinds of sensory deprivation. You know, there's darkness, so you can't see. There's the Mm -hmm. hard smells, so the the feeling of fire, all the sensory kinds of things. And there are all ways to talk about it. Um, So what did you just say? Read that again. Oh, Matthew 8, 12. Sky's got it here. Uh, Am I in the right job? Yeah, Matthew 8. Matthew 8. 12. 12. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Remember, he's talking about Israelites here. Israelites who are sons of the kingdom of God represented by the covenant. Okay, let me back it up again. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, this is when he, this is the centurion, correct? Yeah. With, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, he's, he marvels at the faith of the centurion and says, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does that okay. mean? Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, we're out of time. Well, I think, but, well, okay, one of the big takeaways here, though, is these super simplistic understandings of yeah. hell that a lot of us inherited in our childhood. Need some reexamining. Are very much rooted in our Western cultural understandings rather than what's mm-hmm. actually revealed and in Scripture. And have been influenced by Milton, by Dante, all sorts of by things. By yeah. Chick tracks. <laughs> that's Jack Chick, by the way. I think Jack. Yeah, yeah, it is Jack. It is Jack. Right. Jack Chick. That's yeah. right. But remember, in the end, yeah. it, it's God's business what takes place. Yeah. We know what's expected of us. We know what kind of response yeah. God wants, and we know that God will just. So it's kind of that. simple. It's yeah. kind of simple. We, we know, we know we, he is. We have to accept that he is God. Mm-hmm. We have to fear him. Yes. Meaning we mm-hmm. have to take him seriously, seriously. Mm-hmm. and we have to d- aim to do what is right. <laughs> But one other piece here is I think the reason why we are so um, contorted in our understanding of this is for a lot of decades, maybe centuries, we have used a very explicit vision of hell for evangelistic purposes. Scare people into the to kingdom. To scare people into the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And that's, not, insurance policy. that's yeah. not really a tactic you see in the New Testament. They right, don't right. go into this elaborate detail of the sufferings of hell in order to win people to Christ. That's just They not. talk about who Christ is. 
Yeah, yeah. but and it, we, that's maybe another podcast for another day. But Probably. It's, it, it's a lot more nuanced and complicated than we want to often think. Okay. Have you written anything on hell? Um, I've talked about the Old Testament views yeah. of it and their, their, their lack of lacking. therein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we uh, there's something that happens to you if you die apart from God and you won't like it. Right. <laughs> it won't be fun at all. Okay, let me try to wrap this up <laughs> with clarity. <clears throat> oh. Even though we don't know a lot about hell, we can say with certainty you won't like it very well. So your sins you really shouldn't be exalting. You should listen more to Dr. John Walton when he tells us how we should live and the kind of love that we should give. And we should probably take his classes and buy his books because then (laughs) he can put his kids through college. They're already through college. He can retire. No, we don't want you to retire. We want you to keep writing books. He can be buried. He he (laughs) can take a sabbatical (laughs) and write more about all this stuff. That was almost a really great song. (laughs) Wow. Till the end. Near miss. All right. Thanks, John Walton, for coming back. Thanks so much for being here. Next week, we'll have you back and talk about heaven. (laughs) And then purgatory after that. How about that? Okay. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com.